then we can move on. <laughs> right? But let, you're seriously, right? I mean, don't, well, anyway, y'all. That's why, again, I feel like there's no reason to apologize for such a long quote, because you read the stuff and you'd be like, <laughs> thank you. Still, still, it, after, no matter how many times you read it, anyway, you know. So, um, it could be argued that this is due to the fact that a lot of black people speak pidgin, but that would be too easy. You're traveling by train and ask, excuse me, could you please tell me where the restaurant car is? Yes, sonny boy, you go corridor, you go straight, go one car, go two car, go three car, you there. Let's be, let's be serious. Speaking pigeon means imprisoning the black man and perpetuating a conflictual situation where the white man infects the black man with extremely toxic foreign bodies. There is nothing more sensational than a black man speaking correctly, for he is appropriating the white world. I often have conversations with foreign students. They speak French badly. Little Robinson Crusoe, alias Prospero, is in his element. He explains, informs, comments, and helps them with their studies. But with the black man, he is utterly stupefied. The black man has put himself on an equal footing. The game is no longer possible. He's a pure replica of the white man who has to surrender to the facts. After everything that has been said, it is easy to understand why the first reaction of the black man is to say no to those who endeavor to define him. It is understandable that the black man's first reaction is a reaction. And since he is assessed with regard to his degree of assimilation, it is understandable that, too, why the returning Antillian speaks only French, because he is striving to underscore the rift that has occurred. He embodies a new type of man whom he imposes on his colleagues and family. His old mother no longer understands when he speaks of her PJs, her ramshackle dump, and her lousy joint, all that embellished with the proper accent. And I'm now just pointing out that he's introduced a new figure here in a way that I think is worthy of some emphasis when I come back to try to, to, try to talk about it. And that's the figure of the returning Antillian. Okay. And see, you got to understand that the figure of the returning Antillian already, for, for those of us who love poetry and who think and try to study about it, study it, the image of the returning Antillian is an image of a, of a text, right? The notebook of a return to my native land, written by Aimé Césaire, who was, in fact, um, Fanon's teacher. Okay. So it's a very specific discourse of return that, that, that strikes me as important here. But then it becomes really necessary to think through the differences between the figure of the returning Antillian as Fanon begins to imagine him here and work through in that, that particular psychological complex and the figure of return in a fundamentally different way that Césaire begins to work through in his poetic text, okay? It's two different, and, and I'm interested in maybe even articulating something like a third notion of return in somewhat, somewhat maybe anticipated or inspired by a certain formulation that, 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 uh, that is implied in a text by Baraka, um, a poem by his called The Return of the Native, in which he talks about moving from, from the Greenwich Village to Harlem. And the irony, of course, is that uh, Baraka was born in Newark. <laughs> That's right. So, so, so what's at stake in this return, right? How can we imagine, it again, in a different way, this whole problematic of return? Okay. What does it mean to return to some place that you're not from? Okay. Um, okay. What's problematic in Fenon? <coughs> is the belief in the priority of the standard, except for the special case of the black for whom there is no standard, where standard in its priority corresponds to patria or patrimony. Here what will emerge in Orlando Patterson's discourse is the assertion of the absence of a heritage, wherein a past is detached from or deprived of long historical duration and a natal alienation. At stake in a way that must be understood with more precision than the phrase black civilization and whatever its impossibility might signify is the relation, or in Professor Wilderson's more precise formulation, the antagonism between blackness and civilization. 
the famously mistranslated title of Foucault's opus, uh, L'Histoire des Folies, large classique, and I apologize for my French, has a kind of relevance here in part because the ongoing and irrepressible event of the non-standard, the anti-standard, given now in the language of the standard as madness, as social psychosis, has blackness also for another name. We might consider here the structural relation between name and livery, designation and uniform, precisely in order to think about what historical task their inner inanimative imposition, which takes the form of a sumptuary law, when pharmacon is constrained to be conspicuously consumed, confers upon the ones who have been so burdened. At stake is the givenness of the given's constant disruption, which is prior to its naming, the gift of a project whose conferral is prior to its brutal imposition. This is a massive, immeasurable problematic of responsibility. Meanwhile, the phonics of pigeon is an epiphenomenon, not only in that it is an effect of, but also in that it indicates fabrication. Moreover, it entraps what it indicates. In this view, it's not just that pigeon is prison language, but that being made to speak it imprisons. Imprisonment in pigeon, the imprisonment that is enacted in being made to speak pigeon is itself an epiphenomenon of epidermalization, nothing more than its verbal accompaniment. Implicit here, again, is the assumed priority of the standard. One is made to speak pigeon in response to an imposition, in response to speech uttered in bad faith. The standard rises as a kind of background that pigeon falls pitiably and pitifully, fails pitiably, pitiably and pitifully to represent. That failed representation is then burlesqued and parodied by the white whose utterance, whether in, condensate, whether in condescension or in a more direct kind of cruelty, is meant to do nothing other than impose the, the subordination and incarceration that is instantiated in the black man as good nigger's speech. In outlining a certain problematic of return, the problem of why, upon his return to the Antilles, the privileged one desires to speak good French, Fanon describes one who sees himself as moving within a condition in which suspicion of the black student's erudite and standard speech is confined only to the periphery of the university where an army of fools reside. But the point isn't that life in the university undermines any such faith in the wisdom of its inhabitants. The point is that a set of assumptions about class now edge, into, now, edge, now edge into clarity. That the capacity for standard speech, whether of another tongue or of one's own, is aligned with the achievement of a certain interconnection of class status and educational accomplishment. One who recognizes that alignment upon meeting the German who speaks bad French politely assumes that he is an engineer or a lawyer, that he has a language, that he has standards, that he has a home. The black man is the living embodiment and visualization of the absence of the standard, however. And no such assumption can be made about him. But this lived experience of the non-standard, of the standard's absence, does not mean that one is unable either to see or to revere the standard in its idealized locale. The army, as opposed to the ship of fools, that surround and protect the inner sanctum of the metropole, the holy of holies, Need, another, need neither know nor embody the standard that they protect. It is, in fact, you know what? Like, what I'm talking about is that, that general kind of massive, almost comic, non-grammaticalness of the English-only crowd, right? Like, it's almost like a rule that you can only say that shit in the, 